When I was just starting out, I had no idea how to properly use a compressor, and it was pretty discouraging. I'm making this video so you get a better start than I did. Now, there's a lot of information on the internet about compression, but a lot of it is confusing, convoluted, or just like straight up misinformation. By the end of this video, you'll have a much better understanding of compression, and even if you're more advanced, I think you'll pick up some tricks. Let's go. In order to learn how to use compression, we have to first understand exactly what compression really is. The textbook definition of compression, according to Wikipedia, is an operation that reduces the volume of loud sounds or amplifies quiet sounds, thus reducing or compressing an audio signal's dynamic range. Now, I do have to quickly argue that bit about compressors amplifying quiet sounds. Compressors don't really do that. That would be something called an expander. Expanders are basically upside down compressors. I can do a separate video on those if you guys are interested. Compression is basically a way to automatically control the volume or gain of a signal very quickly. It turns down the loud parts so they're at a closer level to the quiet parts. This is called dynamic range control or gain reduction. Dynamic range is the difference between the quietest part of a signal and the loudest part of a signal. Of course, there's a lot of details getting brushed over here, but don't worry. They're coming. Okay, so that's what a compressor is, but what isn't a compressor? This flashlight, for instance, is not a compressor. Oh, why did I do that? Also, a volume fader isn't a compressor. And a compressor isn't a volume fader. This is important. If you just want the signal to be louder and you don't care about the dynamic range, just turn it up. Compressors don't inherently make things louder. In fact, they make them quieter, giving you enough headroom to turn that entire signal up. So the end result is indeed louder, but only if you turn it up after it's been compressed. You can use a compressor to level out a vocal, add punch to drums. It's one of the most important tools for mixing. All right, now that we have a basic understanding of what compression is, let's take a look at some of the typical controls that you'll find on a compressor. Some compressors will have a ton of controls and others will have a very limited set of controls. The four basic parameters of compression are attack, release, ratio, and threshold. Many compressors will also have input gain and or output gain or makeup gain. There are also a slew of other controls that are available on different types of compressors. Many will have a side chain or key input control, knee control, range or multiband options, and potentially some kind of gimmicky stuff like character, punch, or analog. All right, now into the nitty gritty of these controls. I will use speeding as in analog. Threshold is the foundation of compressing. It's the point where the compressor begins to work. Think of it as the speed limit. Anything going past that limit is speeding. Now, ratio. Think of ratio as how much you were willing to slow down once you realize that you're speeding. Because you're, you never speed. Me neither. So the ratio is how much the signal is turned down after it crosses the threshold. This is determined by a mathematical ratio. For example, a two to one ratio means that for every two miles an hour above the speed limit, you're willing to slow down by one mile per hour. Now just replace miles per hour with decibels. So for every two decibels you go above the threshold at a two to one ratio, the signal will turn down by one decibel. The higher the ratio, the more compression. So a one to one ratio means there's no compression going on and an infinite to one ratio lets nothing pass. In other words, limiting. Attack and release times are just like your reaction times. Attack being how quickly you brake or let off the accelerator once you start speeding and release being how fast you accelerate once you've dipped below that speed limit. A slow attack will let more of the initial transient through before the compressor starts to kick in, while a fast attack will let less through. So here's a slow attack. And here's a fast attack. The release is the other side of the situation. Once the signal drops below the threshold, the gain reduction will go back to zero. Release is how much time that takes. So here's a fast release. And here is a slow release. We also need to talk about the knee. knee. The knee is this little bendy bit. It determines when the compressor reaches the full compression ratio. A hard knee means that the ratio takes full effect immediately, while a soft knee gradually increases the ratio, giving you a smoother transition from not compressed to fully compressed. These are the primary functions. Everything kind of revolves around those functions. But wait, there's more. 
Okay, side chaining. This is a pretty common tool in modern music. Side chaining is a really cool feature that can be used for several things. What it does is send a different source to trigger the compressor than the one you're actually running through the compressor. You can send a filtered version of your signal to trigger the compressor, which can be useful for sounds with a lot of low end that cause the compressor to work too hard, or a different sound altogether. The classic side chain usage is to send a kick drum to the compressor to duck whatever your source is. This is useful for those epic EDM pumps. It's also useful for a lot of other things, like you can send vocals to trigger a bus compressor to duck everything down to let those vocals cut through the mix more. You'll also see a knob in some compressors called mix or wet and dry. This is used to mix the compressed signal with the uncompressed signal in a technique called parallel compression. Parallel compression is awesome, but it's best to make sure you have a solid grasp on regular compression before you start getting all fancy with parallel compression. A couple of other advanced features you might see are stereo linking and detection style. These can make a significant impact on how the compressor reacts and how it sounds. There's also something called multiband compression where you are individually compressing different frequency bands. Today, we're only focusing on single band compression because multiband compression is a whole new can of worms and it can get pretty spicy. I hope you're keeping up so far because now we're moving on to the different types of compressors. I love this part. Traditionally, they say there are four types of compressors, but in reality, there's really five. VCA, FET, Optical, and Verimu are the traditional four, but we also have digital compressors, which borrow aspects from all of the other four and introduce some of their own characteristics. VCA, or Voltage Controlled Amplifier Compressors, are your standard SSL and API style compressors, as well as DBX-160s and Distressors. These are typically very clean and precise. They typically will have full adjustability with attack, release, threshold, and ratio control. VCAs are great for pretty much everything, but they work especially well on buses. FETs, or field effect transistor compressors are typically your 1176s and 1176 style compressors. These were some of the first solid state compressors to come out and they are still excellent today. The 1176 in particular is an incredibly versatile compressor known for its ridiculously fast attack and super easy to use controls. I love FET compressors for vocals, drums, and anywhere else that I need super fast, precise control. One thing you need to know about the 1176 though is that the attack and release knobs work backwards from other compressors where left is slow and right is fast. Just take note of that because it can kind of throw you off at first. Optical compressors. Okay, these are really cool because the hardware versions of these actually use like light dependent resistors to detect the signal. The quintessential opto compressor model is the LA-2A, but optical compression has also found its way into more modern units like the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. Optos are usually pretty slow and have even more simple controls than the 1176. Like the LA-2A literally has two knobs and a switch. Gain reduction and output. Set one knob and let it do its thing. Now on to the fanciest of Gucci compressors, Verimu. Verimu compressors are tube-based, and from a circuitry standpoint, they're very similar to a VCA in how they work, but they sound totally different. In this world, we have Manly Verimus, RS-124s, and the Fairchild 670. The analog versions of these compressors are very expensive. We're talking upwards of $40,000 for a Fairchild 670. Or you could get a clone for 10 grand. I've been fortunate enough to be able to use a real 670 a couple times at Ocean Way here in Nashville, and boy howdy is that thing smooth. Luckily for us peasants without an extra 40 G's burning a hole in our pocket, there are some really great plug-in emulations of these compressors that are much more accessible. Now, Verimu compressors tend to have the most character and definitely have a particular sound they impart on the signal. In my opinion, these compressors are best left for specific times when you want to add a little extra character. Don't get me wrong, they're fantastic, but not necessarily a great desert island pick. And that brings us to digital compressors. Digital compressors borrow aspects from all of the previously mentioned compressors and pack it all into one nice little plugin. They're probably most similar to VCA compressors, but they can also be aggressive like an FET compressor or super smooth like an opto compressor. They offer pretty much infinite flexibility, but on the downside, they can be a little bit overwhelming for new users. 
Now, here's a pro tip if you want to get really good at compression. Turn off the automatic makeup gain. In Ableton, it's on by default. In Pro C, it's on by default. A lot of compressors have it on by default. Turn it off on all of them. Save that as your default. Seriously, automatic makeup gain is the worst thing ever because it tricks your brain into thinking that the compressor is doing something that it's not. It automatically boosts the output of the compressor as you lower the threshold. The problem is that the plugin doesn't know what level your input signal is at, so it basically is just guessing as to how much it needs to boost. In well over a decade of using compressors, I've yet to find one in which the automatic makeup gain is actually helpful. It's usually more of a hindrance. Off, off, off. Trust me, you will get so much better at compression by turning this off and adjusting the makeup gain manually. So how else do you get really good at compression? My advice is to pick one compressor to start with and learn the crap out of it. You know what's great? Your DAW comes with a free digital compressor maybe even a few. Just pick one and stick with it for a while. Keep practicing and explore the boundaries of what you can do with your compressor. Once you have a solid handle on it, then you can begin to explore different compressors and how they behave. And of course, just keep practicing, 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 and you will get better. Not only will you get better at compression, you'll get better at mixing as a whole. And before you know it, your mixes are gonna sound so much better than they currently do. And this applies to me. I'm a professional at this and I'm still practicing and still learning and still trying to make my mixes better and better and better. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that you enjoyed this video and found value in it. If you did, please consider subscribing and drop a comment down below and I will see you in the next one.